from Kansas, just west of Garden City. This is the house in which the Herbert Clutter family lived and the house in which they were murdered. How could I tell my mother that her brother and his family were dead? This can't be real. It was quickly turned over to the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. The key evidence were boot marks in the blood. We were able to see a boot print that one could not observe with a naked eye. They knew that there was a potential of a second suspect. We didn't know who did it or why. Everybody was on edge. It truly made a different community. There was fear for the first time. The murders would have been the only subject people were talking about. This was national news. Eventually, they got a huge break in the case. When Dick got out of prison, he was going to get with his buddy, Perry Smith, and go rob the clutters. Well, after the clutter deal, nobody will be able to say Dick Hickok never did anything worthwhile. Once you get beyond 72 hours, it goes to advantage criminal. And in this case, six days had passed. Law enforcement in Las Vegas had received an attempt to locate from the KBI. The car did have the boots that Perry Smith was wearing on the night of the murders. Case is not over yet. You haven't yet convicted the guilty, lying, thieving SOB. That will come. I remember a sense of relief when we knew that the two men had been arrested and that there was not a doubt that they had done it. While the men are coming back from Las Vegas, um, there was a, a tremendous feeling of suspense in Garden City. Now, what time, I do not know, because I don't know what Mr. Dewey has planned. I don't know how, uh, what the, the, the thing, how far along it is, as far as he's concerned. The day that they brought the people back, my husband was a uh, reporter for the newspaper. And he said so it was just eerie, the feeling of the crowd. There was a mob mentality. The community wanted to hang them. But law enforcement, they did maintain um, peace. There was almost a parade feel in that the courthouse lawn was filled with, with adolescents chasing and teasing, with people who knew the clutters, with, with just curious people as well. They're all around the courthouse, all trying to see what Harry Smith and uh, uh, Richard Hickok look like. For hours, they've been anticipating the killers. They wanted to see evil incarnate. But it turned out on all they saw were two sort of roustabouts. It was Sunday morning, early 1960. And as was my custom, I was sitting in the living room reading Time magazine. And I came across this article about this murder in, in Kansas. And it didn't mean that much to me. But then I saw two tiny pictures. And I was taken aback. I mean, I was shocked when I saw one of them was Perry Smith, my army buddy. I could not believe it. How could he end up like this? And I said, I've got to write him a letter. And I wrote the letter. Shortly after that, I had a telephone call from his lawyer who asked me if I could come out and be a character witness for Perry Smith. I felt this was a man who really needed help and maybe this is something I could do and should do. I wasn't terribly happy that he was going. He had, this man had murdered that whole family. 
And I couldn't imagine telling people about it. And they'd think he was kind of crazy to do something like that. It wasn't something that most people would find acceptable or difficult, certainly difficult to understand. That's for sure. Hmm. And so I flew out to Garden City to see Perry. That's right, in federal uh, approved jails. You keep them separated? That's right. It was about seven o'clock in the morning in Garden City, and I was met by Perry's lawyer, and we drove to the courthouse. Brought me up and told me that I could talk to Perry. So he unlocked the door, and I went inside, and he locked it behind me, so the two of us were locked together. We then sat down, and we started to talk. And he told me exactly, step by step, what had happened. He said, they drove to this place far away. You know, Kansas is a big state. It's a long drive, because they, they were driving for hours before they got there. I had never heard of this little town of Holcomb. I was unfamiliar with the area. Dick kept mumbling to himself. And he was saying, this is supposed to be here. This is supposed to be here. And all of a sudden, he brightened up and he said, this is it. This is it. I was getting a little shit in my blood, as they say. So I was determined to talk Dick out of it. Then he shut the lights off. He said, this guy ain't got money. Just look at the setup. I know damn well he's got a safe in there. I could see right away. He had his mind set. Dick. Now, you say he cleaned 12 and 1 is when you arrived there at the farm. Yes. Now, both of you entered the house through the office door. Right. That door was unlocked. Yes. The clutters did not lock their doors at night. They trusted their neighbors. They didn't expect evil to come to their door. What happened then, Dick? They shined the flashlight around looking for the safe. Did you find the safe? No. There was nothing, but Perry said they found Mr. Clutter downstairs. And he said, we asked him for the money, and he said, there's no money in this house. But Dick, he didn't believe it. I thought Dick was going to hit him. Dick said, bullshit. You got a safe in this house. I know it. Dick Hickok was just insistent that the money existed and that Mr. Clutter was lying. And at that point, I still think that Perry Smith did not think that there was going to be any violence that was going to occur that evening. Mr. Clutter, he had such an honest look on his face. I knew he was telling the truth about the safe. I looked at Dick. Dick says to me, better take care of that phone. That's when Smith cut the telephone line. Smith cut the telephone line. Yes. I pointed upstairs and asked who was up there. He said his wife and children were up there. What happened then? Well, we got the woman up, and Mrs. Clutter. And she was in bed. Yes. Mr. Clutter said, Honey, don't be scared. These two men, they want some money. The missus said, my husband told you the truth. We have no safe here. Dick asked Mrs. Clutter where her purse was. 
I think Dick found a few dollars. From there, we went to the boys' room. What happened then? When did we got the boy up? Well, what's the boy's name? Chidget. All right, then, then what happened? What did the girl do? What was her name? Nancy. The daughter was already awake. She asks, what do you fellas want? Dick told her, it's none of her business. At the time, I was thoroughly disgusted, especially with Dick's attitude. Dick was still persistent that there was a safe. And what did you do with them then? Put them in the bathroom. All of them? Yes. What were you searching for? Most anything. Most of the money. Did you get any money? No. How much did you get? $50. And then Perry said we decided to separate them. I was the one that tied him up. We had to go one by one. So they put Mrs. C over to her bedroom and tied her up. And then took the girl and tied her up in her room. And then he took the boy, and notice, he never used their names. It was always Mrs. C or Mr. C, or the girl or the boy. Never the names, even though he knew them. They took Mr. Clutter and his son down into the cellar in separate rooms. He said, we continued to ask Mr. Clutter about money. And he said, there's no money in this house. If there was, I would give it to you. So then Perry said, he looked over at Dick and said, what do we do now? Dick said, like I said before, if we are identified, you know what it means. I'm in favor of getting rid of them. That night at the Clutter home, Dick Hickok, his sole reason for enlisting the help of Perry Smith is that he thought Perry Smith was a killer. If something like that needed to happen, he had the guy who could do it. But the fact is that neither one of them had the ability to carry out a, a murder by themselves. You know, people ask a lot, do you think Hickok would have killed him had he done this alone? I don't think he'd have been in the house if he was alone. I think it took the second person to give him the courage to be there. And so I think when you put these two individuals together, it created an atmosphere where their minds went to a different place. And for whatever reason, their interactions caused them to kill four innocent people. We were standing there debating about who was going to start it. So I told him, well, I'll do it. I had this big hunting knife. Perry said that Dick was not contributing at all. Perry was really getting furious at this point. He said he was so angry, the situation was fruitless. And he said he had the knife, and he said he shoved the knife right into the throat of Mr. Clutter. He said almost like it was, I was doing it to Dick. What happened then? I heard a commotion in where Mr. Clutter was. I don't know how to describe it more. It's like a, a gurgling noise. That's when I seen that it cut his throat. What did he use to cut up my thing? That's a knife. But he cut the hell out of it. 
And he said, now it's your turn. You do your part. So he handed the knife to Dick, and Dick stuck the knife in his throat. And Perry told me, he said, I think he probably just put it in the same hole I did, because he continued that way. So I says, Dick, the man is suffering. I raised the shotgun and pulled the trigger. And he said, one thing I will always remember, his expression, pitch black. They just took the flashlight around. And he said, as I pulled the trigger, he said, there was a flash of blue light. And I could see his head split apart. My God, my God, how horrible. I walked up to the boy. I couldn't see the boy's head too well, but I aimed the gun to where I thought his head was and shot him. What happened then, Dick? I didn't think you would shoot the women, you know, and uh, shot the girl. You saw that? Yes. What happened then? It was a clutter. To me, it seemed like we was in the house just about an hour. It seemed like that. When we finished talking, I remember, he snickered. And he immediately said, oh, he said, it's a terrible thing to be laughing about this. He said, but I had no feelings of anything, no feelings for them. And I found that most shocking of all. It was hard to take. It was hard to take. The guilt about the murder was established both by uh, admissions and by physical evidence. So the um, attorneys who were representing them could only hope to keep them from being executed. So they decided an insanity defense would be the only way they could think to go. And so that's how I got involved. So the deputy took me up and locked me in the cell with Hickok. Dick Hickok was a sociopathic, but there was some real remorse about having done the crime and having gotten caught, certainly. He said, you know, uh, if somebody had done that to my family, I'd go after him and kill him, blah, blah, blah. The reaction from the community of Edgerton after it was discovered that Richard Hickok was involved in the killing of the Clutters was one of total shock, surprise, disbelief. They all knew Richard as a petty thief, a liar, a con man, but I don't think anybody here really ever thought that he could do something that terrible. But he, he was a complex person with a lot of sides to him. He was impulsive and a lot of the impulsivity seems to have developed after he had the uh, automobile accident when he was 19 years old. The accident, this terrible car accident he was in was in 1950. And there are friends and family that later swore that, that he changed then because he had a terrible brain injury and the doctors didn't really take care of it or weren't aware of it or ignored it. His first wife, Carol, she said after that accident in the car that he, he changed. He changed into someone that she did not recognize. I myself had a little sickness. I think this was caused from the car wreck that I had. I had spells of passing out and sometimes I'd hemorrhage out of the nose and left ear. Between the first and last one, I believe I've had about 10 of these. So an unanswered question is, did he have some slight degree of um, actual physical brain damage?
Perry Smith, when I got in the cell with him, he was very interested in talking. He told me, he said, well, I've always wanted to talk to a psychiatrist because he was interested in his mind. He was interested in what in the world made him tick. And many times he said, there's something wrong with me or I wouldn't have killed those people. Smith, you know, he had a strong paranoid mindset and uh, he had a fantasy life that bordered on delusion. Of course, the delusions and hallucinations are in indicative of a psychotic mind state and uh, he was deeply bitter about some of his early experiences. When I was about five, Perry was my dad's friend. I remember he was so messed up emotionally and psychologically. I think it had a lot to do with uh, his anger towards his father and mother. And was given to sudden uncontrolled rages in which he would attack people including family members. He fought with his father many times. Uh, you got a real traumatized individual that can quickly turn violent. To get additional background information, you can ask a patient to write an autobiographical statement, and particularly if you're pressed for time, which I was and needed some background. So they did that. Dear Dr. Jones, please find enclosed somewhat of an autobiography I was constantly in trouble. I got into many fights at school and was expelled. I blamed many people for my lack of education. This only added to the many other hatreds and bitterness I held for others. Those autobiographical statements, which are very helpful, very complete, very honest. In fact, in Hickok's autobiography, he talked about his attraction to younger girls. One afternoon, I went to the store someplace and an eight or 12 year old girl wanted to go with me. I don't know why I did it. I asked her if she knew where babies come from and I tried to show her. I won't go into detail with the rest of the times, but. There was one, I believe, as recently as a few months ago. Dick, he liked teenage girls, and Carol, for instance, his first wife was only 16 when she had the boys, and he got another girl pregnant while he was married to Carol. So yeah, he even around in Edgerton, he had an attraction for young girls. Well, Dick was ashamed of that and hadn't told anybody that, in fact, he told me that night in Holcomb, he uh, had designs on the teenage girl in the house. One thing I never told you about this clutter deal is this. Before I ever went to their house, I knew there'd be a girl there. I think that's the main reason I went there. It was not to rob them but to rape the girl. I thought a lot about it. The one reason why I never wanted to turn back, even when I saw there was no safe. I did make some advances toward the clutter girl when I was there. I would have gone through with it, but Perry never gave me the chance. A smith had become enraged at Hickok. Dick mentioned the possibility, how do I put this, the rape of Nancy. He said that night, I sure would like to bust that little girl's box out the way she's built. He says, after I do it, you can do it. And I said, Jesus Christ, Dick, nothing like that. That's out. That's completely out. In fact, I was ready to fight him. This is where all hell broke out. Perry Smith's rages were partly fueled by the bitterness and paranoid quality to his thinking they already had, and partly just by loss of control. You know, that, uh, and once he lost control, there was no stopping him.
There were other things I should have told you. Because I'm more ashamed of these things I did than hanging or going to the penitentiary. My lawyer said I should be truthful with you as you can help me. And I need help, as you know. Would like to speak with you again. There's much I haven't said that may interest you. Or that should be known. People in Holcomb still don't like to talk about this. Have you experienced that any? They don't want to talk about it. They don't think it's something that needs to be discussed a lot. But I grew up here in the courthouse, and having this case in the background of where I lived was normal, something that I've always accepted. My name is John Craig. My dad was sheriff here for almost 30 years. And so we moved into the courthouse in the spring of 64. So yes, I knew all about it by the time I was in fourth grade, all of the people that were involved. But I knew most of them growing up. The courtroom looks like it did. But this trial would have been the only subject people were talking about. You probably wouldn't have been able to go anywhere here and talk about anything else. But also remember, so Garden City was flooded with reporters when that trial happened. Um, people were going to know all about it. This was national news. Al Dewey offered Truman Capote and Nell Harper Lee the opportunity to interview the men separately, and they were going to get, in essence, an audience with the killers. Dick came in bummed a couple of smokes off Nell Harper Lee, and just waxed lyrical about good old Dick Hickok. What a regular guy he was and how he liked smokes and steak, and Dick just had the world on a string. Perry, on the other hand, was very wary of what was going on and um, was not willing to be put on display. At one point, Perry said to him, you know, I could... I could kill you. I could kill you right now if I wanted to. Of course, he didn't kill Truman, and uh, he, was, he was fascinated by Truman. Truman, of course, was very short, and Perry was short, only an inch taller. And Truman found that vastly endearing, that this very, very dangerous man was not a big man, but someone who was in essence, too small for the world. When Truman saw Perry, he saw himself. The trouble was, for Truman, was that these two, Perry was a killer. He was a, he was a man who had murdered people. The case by that time had really become well known. You know, this is a couple of months after the guys were caught. So there was tremendous public interest for the uh, trial. There were a couple hundred people in the county courthouse. Commotions were high, and the people there, they felt that justice would be two guilty verdicts. As we approached the courtroom, there were a lot of people who just couldn't get in because the place was absolutely packed. There was not an empty seat anywhere, and there were people standing on both sides. Perry's lawyer brought me right up to the bailiff and said, this is a friend of Perry Smith's. Let him sit beside him. He took me in, and we sat beside each other for the whole trial. Mass murder was the theme of the trial. The county attorney read eight charges of murder in the first degree. He read the names of each victim twice, one for each of the two accused. Hickok chewed gum vigorously during the reading. Smith, face blank, 
looked straight ahead. I got a lot of gray hairs that year because it does affect your system. And of course, we went to the trial every day. And I went to the restroom and Hickok's mother and sister were in there. And of course, they were just as upset as anybody was. We saw those guys sit up there. And my dad, this nice man, but he said, I could pull that rope. Because they did it. Well, they were just so guilty, you know, they really, the only thing was, were they gonna get hung? If it pleases the court, I, Dwayne E. West, county attorney, come here and give the court to understand the magnitude of this crime. We believe warrants the maximum penalty for both these defendants. Prosecution spent something like four days, and they were really clearly dragging it out because it was their moment in the sun, so to speak. And they already had written confessions from both of them, so it was overkill. Spectators filled the seats in the courtroom early as they have all through the sensational trial. Our trial was more like a circus than anything else. Uh, I uh, have, have answered that question before. And I have no idea. I hadn't, didn't have an opportunity to visit with these fellows at all. I never did think much of the Finney County attorney. He kept pointing his finger at me and telling the jury how no good I was. My mom was crying. It was worse on her than anybody. Every time he pointed that finger at me, wanted to hit him. It was a funny feeling to be in the same room with murderers. I don't think they were sorry. They didn't act like they were sorry. That bothered me. I'm not sure that Perry Smith was really what they would call a sociopath, but his actions branded him as a sociopath. You had to really be able to disconnect to what you'd done. It had to be unreal to you, and it had to have no social impact upon you as a person. Cold-hearted killer. In Garden City, I hear no one, not even the accused themselves, suggest that they are innocent. The question will be, how guilty? Guilty enough to hang? What can the defense do? in them cases like this. What the defense attorney does is present testimony that convinces the jury that these men were guilty but insane so that there's some mitigation of the punishment. You know, Perry Smith's borderline psychotic mind state. And um, with uh, Hickok, you had his head injury. So these are what I would think of as mitigating factors. So I went in and I took the stand. And before I even testified, the judge said, doctor, you can only answer uh, one question, yes or no, to the question, did this person know right from wrong at the time they committed the crime? I uh, answered yes for Hickok. For Smith, he said, have you reached an opinion? And I said, no. Then the defense attorney jumped up and said, the doctor doesn't have an opinion, and the judge dismissed me. There'll be a five-minute recess. When I was called to the witness stand, I started out by saying that I'd known Perry, who had served in the United States Army, and that he was a very likable fellow. And that's about as far as I get. Objection. It was objected to as not pertain to the case. Hardly a moment went by and the judge said, sustained. The witness may sit down. And I was dismissed. I, I was quite shocked, frankly, when he said that. But what else are you going to do? On March 28th, a week after the trial began, 
the defense pleaded for life in prison. It was no contest. Logan Green, a small man, became a giant before the jury. Logan Green, yes, Logan Green. The state hired him to help with the uh, prosecution because it was such an important case. In fact, attorneys from all over Kansas came to hear Logan Green's performance because he was that good. I say to you, gentlemen, these were not ordinary murders. Four of your fellow citizens, without an enemy in the world, have been brutally slain as a pen of slaughtered hogs. These were cold, calculated, premeditated, useless murders for money. And how cheaply those lives were bought at $80 worth of loot. That is $20 a piece for each of these lives. It took the jury less than a half an hour to come to a complete decision, all hands voting for death.
I was able to see him one last time. Perry had this big grin on his face. He said, well, I guess I better start my next stretching exercises. And the grin disappeared. His head dropped. Mine dropped. We reached down. We were holding each other's hands through the grate. And then I think we both cried at that point. And said, said goodbye. And then I went downstairs and caught my bus. It was the last time I saw Perry Smith. Um, we were so happy with the verdict, and we all wanted to be hung because nothing would have been bad enough for what they did. This is a state prison. This is where it begins. There's very few pictures of the old death house. They always said it looked like the shape of a coffin. You know, this right here, but that's the old death row. Uh, my name is Jerry Collins, and I worked at the death row at the Kansas State Penitentiary from 1963 to 1965. Ours is midnight to eight, and I was very young. I was 23 at the time. Of course, I had read about Hickok and Smith, and uh, it was kind of a shock when I first saw them. I said, here, I've been reading about them all the time, and there they are. It didn't look like a couple monsters to me. But, uh, well, that was a horrible, horrible thing they did out there at Holcomb. After they arrived in 1960, they had an execution date set up within 90 days. The date of Friday, May 13th, 1960, was given as the date of execution, uh, Friday the 13th, oddly enough. When I worked death row, we got to know Hickok and Smith and got to visiting with them. They didn't think about crimes they committed. We got close to them, joking and laughing. And then when it comes down to the execution, we said, oh, we hate to see these guys executed like there's friends. And that somewhat affected me. Even though the uh, date for the execution was set, once you're sentenced to death anywhere, the appeal process goes on and on and on. They had several stays of execution. Basically, Dick did a lot of letter writing in prison to officials, politicians, judges. There were so many stays of executions, we didn't think Richard Hickok and Perry Smith would hang. We had that fear that they wouldn't be, you know. But I guess we were just glad they were caught and they weren't going to go anywhere. The Hickok family went into a desperate shift of survival because it was so notorious a crime. Everyone knew about it. And you were just ordinary people in the midst of this storm of hatred and judgment. And that's when the spiraling of their whole life was downward. I can tell you that our lives were never the same. We died a little every day as we tried to survive the aftermath. The family wasn't seen in public much any longer, uh, that they really tried to maintain a low profile, and that there was a great deal of shame that they felt. These were two very good people. Walt and Eunice Hickok were the salt of the earth Edgerton residents, but they never really fully recovered from that stigma. Mr. Hickok, Dick's father, was very sick. He had cancer. And he actually died in June of 1960, which was a few months after the trial. He could not fight. You know, I think he gave up in his fight because he was just so burdened and so hurt by what his son had done.
the nine one. Switch that over, but I stay down. Uh, I was at the West Coast, now I'm in the East Coast. Saw you when I